This program is brought to you by Emory University. I want to thank you all for coming out, uh, especially braving the monsoon that has engulfed this city and avoiding the monstrous puddles that I'm sure are on every highway. Um, to this, the Emory Bankruptcy Development Journal's 16th Annual Symposium. My name is Mark Gensberg. I'm the editor-in-chief of the Emory Bankruptcy Development Journal. Uh, we have a fantastic symposium set out for all of you uh, today. Uh, but at this point, to kick off the symposium, uh, I would like to invite to the podium uh, the dean of our law school, uh, Dean Hughes. Good morning. I'm pleased to welcome you to the Emory Bankruptcy Developments Journal Symposium. Um, and I, I have to issue an apology as I get started. Um, I'm going to have to duck out immediately, and I'll be in and out during the day. I think other than the judges in the room, uh, we all have bosses, and I have to meet with my boss, the provost, immediately after this. So I'll be ducking out, but coming in, in and out after that. So as you know, this marks the 36th year of the Emory Bankruptcy Developments Journal. And this is its 16th annual symposium. And uh, next month, uh, we'll hold, or the journal will hold its 21st annual banquet. And at that time, they will honor Jamie Spravagen, a restructuring partner with the Chicago and New York offices of Kirkland and Ellis, with a Distinguished Service Award for Lifetime Achievement. As you know, the bankruptcy uh, program here is a signature program of the law school. Uh, it provides a curriculum that truly integrates theory with practice and also integrates the paths of practitioners, students, scholars, and judges. It's actually a, a model, we think. We don't think there are many other programs like this in the country. And I just want to brag a little bit about our EBDJ students. So over the last two graduating classes, five EBDJ members are serving as clerks to US Bankruptcy Court judges. Thank you, judges. Uh, one just completed a bankruptcy clerkship. Four are currently with or just finished U.S. District clerkships with U.S. District Court judges. One is with the U.S. Uh, Court of, uh, Circuit Court of Appeals for the 11th Circuit Staff Attorney's Office. And three are in state clerk, uh, court clerkships. In the last year, the Emory Bankruptcy Developments Journal has been cited by nine courts, including the Sixth Circuit Court of Appeals, and EBGJ pieces have been cited in over 30 other law reviews. Uh, before we begin, there are always people that we need to thank. Uh, and of course, I'd like to thank our generous sponsors who are listed in your programs. Uh, EBDJ faculty advisor, Professor Raphael Pardo. Um, <clears throat> alumni advisor, uh, Keith Shapiro, class of 1983. And all members of the EBDJ advisory board. Thank you all. Uh, executive symposium editor, James Reisner. Symposium editor, Maria Valderrama. EBDJ Editor-in-Chief, Mark Ginsburg. And also, I'd like to thank some of our tremendous staff members who always assist us and enable us to put on these programs. Uh, Scott Andrews, uh, Corky Gallo, Rhonda Hermans, Danae Duran, and Amy Marcellana. And of course, I'd like to thank today's panelists, including uh, this panel, uh, for coming here to enlighten us today. And now I'd like to invite uh, Executive Symposium Editor Jake Reisner to the podium to introduce our first panel. Thank you so much for being here. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for being here today. Uh, and thank you once again to our sponsors. Uh, we def definitely couldn't do it without them, and we uh, are very grateful for their continued support. Um, uh, I'd also like to thank uh, some of the people who, who uh, helped me on the ground put this together. Um, so, of course, Rhonda Hermans was so incredibly helpful, as always. Um, all the people in the marketing department, uh, I'm very thankful for their support. I'm thankful for Mark's help, uh, Mark Ginsburg's help as my editor-in-chief, and I'm thankful for Maria Valderrama as my uh, symposium editor. Um, I'm also thankful to all of the members of our panelists for uh, for flying in and, and driving in. Um, I would also like to extend a special thanks to um, the person I'm about to invite to the stage, uh, Mr. Mark Dudall, um, who's been an advisory member 
uh, advisory board member of the journal since 2003 and has consistently shown support for uh, the journal and has really helped uh, put this together. Um, thank you so much, Mark. Uh, if, you'd like to, if you'd like to come up to the podium. Thank you so much. Jake, you're a gentleman. You and Mark have done a tremendous amount of work to put this on. You guys have really done a great job. This is a, a, a really outstanding program this year. And once again, the journal comes through. Before I uh, introduce uh, this panel, which is a really neat panel with a lot of really engaging thoughts on this topic, um, uh, let me just say I'm really excited about what's going on in the journal. The fact that Jamie Spray Reagan is going to be the honoree at this year's uh, annual banquet is wonderful. He is one of the originators of modern Chapter 11 practice uh, at Kirkland and Ellis, and then at Goldman Sachs, and then back at Kirkland and, Kirkland and Ellis. And the level of continuity that the journal has been able to maintain over the years, and that you are maintaining by being here and by supporting it, is really through the roof. Our, our honoree at the annual banquet, banquet have included people like Senator Elizabeth Warren, Senator Daschle, uh, uh, Henry Miller, the, the originator of the modern bondholder refinancing uh, and bondholder workout. I mean, it's just a wonderful thing that you're continuing to support the journal and the journal is able to continue to, to advance the bankruptcy community over time. Let me start with the panelists. Um, the topic today is tuition clawback, which is a very simple way to understand what could be a very simple issue, but actually there are a lot of layers to this onion. And the neat thing is, some of them are complex, others are not. And like I said, it, it, it generates somewhat of a, a visceral reaction in people. Can a bankruptcy trustee sue a college for receipt of tuition? Bankruptcy trustee sues the college for receipt of tuition from the debtor to pay for the debtor's child's education, to pay for the debtor's child's education. Very, very interesting issue, somewhat straightforward, then it gets more and more complex, but that's what we're gonna talk about today. The panelists are wonderful. We have Liz Austin, Elizabeth Austin, from Pullman and Comley up in Connecticut. She spent her career, the first part of her career, working on some of the most complex chapter 11s you will ever see out of the United States Trustee's Office. She was one of the uh, uh, originators of, of some of the thoughts and rulings that came out of these cases. She was also, as a member of the Trustee's Office, one of the speed bumps and governors to ensure that there was transparency and openness and adherence to the code while these large bankruptcies were going forward that had so many jobs and so much money on the line. So she had a, had a wonderful career. She joins us here from, like I said, from Connecticut. In a few weeks, she's going to be going out to Vancouver to speak to the American Bar Association on another bankruptcy issue. She is a thought leader in bankruptcy matters um, and, and really a model for us all. Neil Gordon, uh, those of you who practice know this. Those of you who are students do not. He is a legend of the Atlanta bankruptcy community. He has been a fiduciary. He has advised fiduciaries. He has taught fiduciaries. He is a fiduciary in every sense of the word and his skill and his adherence to the law and the fiduciary standards and teaching others through over 150 presentations in his career is a model for us all. He has given so much uh, to this field and it's really special for us that he's here. And he's done this fiduciary practice while working for a big firm, which I don't even understand to begin with. So it's proof positive you can do so many neat things with a bankruptcy career. And Neil is really just a, a, a model for that. Mike Imber joins us from Eisner Amper. He's the only non-lawyer here. As a result, he will be the only voice of sanity on this entire <laughs> panel. <Yeah. laughs> Good luck. Mike's a managing director working out of New York for Eisner Amper, an outstanding advisory and accounting firm. He's the co-head of the public sector advisory practice, which works on advising states, localities, cities, on all matters of financial distress as well as colleges and universities. Mike's been practicing in this area for well over 25 years. I had the pleasure to work with Mike when I was a lot younger and when he was a lot younger as well. We both had more hair. We both had more hair. The belt was a few loops over. 
um, on a Chapter 11 prepackaged plan, which was a very simple case until about three months in when the prepack became unpacked and it turned into a, uh, just, a, just a disastrous case that ended up as a successful Chapter 11 yeah. after a lot of gnashing of teeth. It was a textile company. That's what's so neat about restructuring. You get these funny stories everywhere. It was a textile company in North Carolina that made a lot of specialty textiles. They also made a lot of rugs. And uh, part of their, their thoughts for, for coming out of bankruptcy, this was uh, just after 9-11, was we have the equipment to make specialty rugs. We're going to make rugs that have the American flag on them, and everyone's going to buy them. Until at some point someone said, you know, I'm not sure stepping on the American flag as you come in and out of your house each day is a, <laughs> is a viable opportunity. So Mike and I go way back. we got a lot of good stories, and he is going to bring a lot of expertise to this from the public sector. Uh, we have Len Xeris from Holland and Knight, uh, uh, a wonder in that she has managed to stay at a major law firm her entire career. As people jump from place to place to place, she has succeeded in Boston at Holland and Knight, a secondary market, Boston, like Atlanta, but where she's managed to carve out a very sophisticated Chapter 11 practice. I mean, really something very impressive. Writes a great deal. I met Lynn when I wrote on this issue on my little blog, and she wrote on this issue on her blog. Liz was writing about it. Neil was teaching people about it 10 years ago. Um, and I thought I was onto something new, and then I realized Liz and Neil and, and, and Lynn have been writing about it for years, but they still talk to me about the issue, which I thought was very generous of them. So we're real pleased to have Lynn here, uh, coming all the way from Boston and taking time out of her schedule as a big firm, as a big firm lawyer. Uh, to write on these issues and speak on these issues. So it's just a great panel. I'm really appreciative to all of you for doing this. Let's start with the basics, because it's going to get more complex as we go. But if we talk about the basics for a little while, I think that might help. Neil, is this just a straightforward application of fraudulent transfer law? Maybe a straightforward application of, of Statute 13 Elizabeth that existed 400 years ago. You gave something away and you didn't get anything for it. Is it that simple? Is, is there nothing else to talk about? Well, the case is going different directions, so the, the, there's no easy yes to this. Uh, I'd say probably half the people in this room have heard me present this topic, and I've done it without anybody on the other side of the issue, and it goes very quickly. Um, now I've got three people on the other side of the issue, so I asked for equal time, and they said no. Uh, um, when you're getting into fraudulent transfer law, in this area, it's the same law. It's 548, the same defenses, except there are more defenses in this area than there are in other areas because there are unique aspects to how you finance an education. And if you're a trustee and you don't understand what these defenses are, you can waste a lot of time. So um, in my practice, I try to get into it very early, how the financing occurred of the... Um, uh, education of an adult child, and we're only talking about, in my perspective, an adult child, not a minor child. Um, and apparently, how what the adult is is defined differently in other states too. But in most states, it's going to be age 18. But when you're talking about is it uniform? Should it be uniform? Well, the answer to me is yes. Um, the real differences come down to how you interpret reasonably equivalent value. A lot of people are very unhappy, uh, people associated with universities. I've ha I have had panels where I've had law professors on the panels with me, and they're defending the university side. I've spoken to the National Association of Attorney Generals. They defend the state universities, and they're really irate about this area. Um, uh, it's costing them a lot of time. They don't generally have a lot of bankruptcy expertise, and they're being thrown into the bankruptcy courts to defend these actions. But it's really, and to answer Mark's question, to me, if you want to carve out an exception to 548, then you have to do it legislatively. You're not going to be able to do it judicially. Uh, the First Circuit has had a case, and this panel is involved in that case, uh, but um, it's had a case uh, on direct certification from um, the bankruptcy court in Massachusetts, uh, Palladino case, uh, Mark Giacomo is the trustee, and they've had it for over two years, and we thought that was going to be the first circuit court to really get into the reasonably equivalent value issue, which is what the appeal concerned, and we haven't gotten a decision from them. But I can tell you that when BAPSIPA was being negotiated, 
and the lobbyists came out of the woodworks and um, those that sort of started the process of um, amending the bankruptcy laws were the big losers uh, because once you open up Pandora's box, all the lobbyists come out, the landlords benefited, all these different groups benefited, the car lenders, but also they added exceptions to the um, 548 for charitable institutions. Uh, 548A2. So you, you can't just sue for the charitable institutions because there was a legislative change, uh, only in certain circumstances. The same thing could be done if they want to in this area. And there was a bill, uh, Protecting All College Tuition Act of 2015, that went nowhere. Um, I, I know a lot of legislation goes nowhere in Washington, but this was one of them that went nowhere. And, um, and they, could, they could resuscitate that or some other piece of legislation if they want to build an exception to 548. But until they do, I, in my opinion, the law's got to be applied uniformly. And so the real question comes down to reasonably equivalent value and is paying for your adult child's uh, tuition because you expect economic benefits for that child in the, down the road uh, enough. Uh, most of the courts recently have said it's not enough, that it's admirable that you want to pay, but that the creditors aren't really, if you ask them, willing to finance the education. You're taking money that they believe they could be paid with, and instead you're using it to finance a, an education that could be paid in other ways. It could be paid with student loans. It could be paid in different ways. But the, um, um, the only circuit courts that I have seen that are dealing with these intangible non-economic benefits uh, have come out, not a student loan clawback case, student loan, not tuition clawback cases, but in other cases they come out and say that no, intangible non-economic benefits are not sufficient. They don't qualify as reasonably equivalent value. Everybody else on this panel is going to disagree with me, but most of the judges more recently have also taken that position. Everybody understands the pressure that some parents are under if, if they've got the ability to do it. But we're talking about, because we're talking about 548, we're talking about uh, a situation where the uh, parents are either already insolvent or these transfers to, to the universities are, are rendering them insolvent. So it's not like they're flush with money when they're making these payments because if they were solvent, you wouldn't even have the claim to bring. So I think the answer is yes, it, it should be uh, uniform. As to the policy argument, which you'll hear, yes, there's a lot of good policy reasons why you might want to carve out these exceptions for the universities, but as the Supreme Court said in Law v. Siegel in 2014, it doesn't matter how good the policy arguments are. If there's a statute, you've got to follow the statute. Policy arguments don't trump statutes. And I think that is just a simple statement of fact and law, both, that can be applied here in this area. So I think this is very helpful. And we're going to get into reasonably equivalent value in a little bit with, with Lynn and Liz, who are, you know, and, and Liz is litigating it in the, in the trenches in the First Circuit. But we have a clear statement of the law, which I appreciate, um, uh, before you get into reasonably equivalent value. We have an argument for uniform application of the law. You know, in 1978, when, when, the, when the bankruptcy code was enacted, there were, I think, seven or eight exceptions to the automatic stay. There's now 36. Everyone and their brother gets an exception to the automatic stay, and the bankruptcy code is being cannibalized. So we need uniform application of the law. Congress knows how to fix this. They fixed this with the tithe. They got together and they fixed it. They can fix it for the colleges. And at the end of the day, I mean, these aren't the most sympathetic defendants out there. These are universities with endowments, you know, the size of Rhode Island, you know. So, Mike, I mean, Rhode Island's not that big. <laughs> well, then, you know, then, then, then maybe a, a small county in uh, southern Georgia. But, I mean, but seriously, I mean, Mike, what's the big deal? I mean, this is, this is, this, these costs can be spread over thousands of students, and we're trying to get uniformity of the system. So, I don't understand. <sighs> or am I being obtuse? I would never say that about you, Mike, but... Um, <laughs> I think this is a case where public policy gets to sit in the front seat with the law. Uh, we may need airbags, but I think public policy gets to sit in the front seat. Um, bankruptcy court, at least in my experience, and hopefully everybody in here, uh, is a court of equity. And everything's negotiable. So um, I, as a former and recovering banker, I re respect and appreciate creditor rights. 
but um, in my experience, uh, there have been exceptions where the law seems to get ignored in favor of public policy. Uh, the most striking example for me is I've worked on three chapter nine bankruptcies. And uh, in my experience in Detroit and then looking at other cases in San Bernardino and Stockton, um, retirees, unsecured claims, in theory are peri passu with pension obligation bondholders. This was my experience in, uh, in Detroit with some exceptions, but you would think they'd all get treated the same way, yet the retirees in the Detroit case realized 68% recovery while my clients, uh, who had financed a $1.4 billion contribution to the pension fund, uh, only realized a 13% recovery. So where's peri passu? Where's absolute priority? And I think in the Detroit case, there was a there's a public policy argument that uh, is put forward that says we gotta take care of the retirees. So moving back to the universities, uh, this country has long advocated and supported at the, at the federal level uh, higher education for its citizens. We're a stronger and better country for having well-educated kids and we thrive that way. And I think that it would be an undue burden on universities to have to reserve monies for potential clawback, uh, especially as if, if we go into another downturn, uh, that we're gonna have to refund tuition. And I just think this is an exception. Uh, the other public policy argument that, granted it's written into statute, but uh, how many people can we think of who consolidated all their wealth and bought a big house down in Florida and uh, protected themselves uh, under the Homestead Act down there. It's like, that kind of flies in the face of, uh, of consumer, you know, the, 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 the consumer bankruptcy laws. It's like, we can hide our assets in our house down in Florida. So I, I, I'm, I'm not buying this. I think we need to defend the kids. Okay. Right. You, know, you know, in Florida, uh, you probably do know this, um, there are rulings that fraudulent transfer law doesn't apply to a house because that, that's a statute and the, the protection of the home is in the Florida Constitution and the Florida Constitution trumps statute. So it actually is even more complicated down in Florida, more clear. Let me get back to you after but I go more to law clear school. To your point. <laughs> more clear to your point. You can't, you can't bring fraudulent transfer action with respect to if you go and you paid off your home, the mortgage on your home, in a fraudulently transfer, whatever, you, it's not recoverable because it's in the Florida Constitution that the home's protected. So I, I think this frames the, the legal issue in a very policy format. And that's what's so neat about this, is it's a very understandable issue and it, 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 can, it can pull both sides each way. Um, now that I think we understand the legal issue, and by the way, jump in with questions at any time. We're gonna be up here for a little while and the more questions we have, the better. Now that we frame the legal issue, let me turn it over to Liz, and Lynn, you would jump to jump in as well. Um, Liz, we need a ruling out of the First Circuit in the Palladino case, which was, was a, a, a major case that went straight up to the First Circuit. It's been sitting there forever. The First Circuit is picking on the poor Puerto Rico Restructuring Council, ruling it unconstitutional, like the Constitution applies to bankruptcy, which we know it doesn't. When are we, tell folks about Palladino and then tell folks what the holdup is and when we're gonna get a ruling. Like, I feel like we need to roll into a little bit more though, right? Just to talk a little bit about what, so what the court, so what's, so what the courts are saying, what the arguments the parties are making, right? Right. Yes, exactly. please, exactly. please. Exactly. Yeah. What is the reasonably equivalent value? What's going exactly. on here? Exactly, exactly. Well, in Palladino, um, uh, Mark DiGiacomo, the trustee sued Sacred Heart University, my client, and um, we, argued, and, and it was kind of an interesting twist in that case because the uh, debtors had been um, convicted of uh, participating in a Ponzi scheme, so there was a presumption of fraud. So um, going in, I had quite a, quite a battle, but I was able to rebut the presumption of fraud uh, with Judge Hoffman uh, determining that not, and, and the, the law is not quite well developed in the First Circuit on that issue, but in the Second Circuit it's very well developed that that you can show that not every payment made um, in, uh, by anyone participating in a Ponzi scheme is necessarily 
uh, in furtherance of that Ponzi scheme. For example, you buy groceries, you, you make a car payment, whatever. So the court found that making tuition payments um, was clearly not in furtherance of a Ponzi scheme. So I was able to rebut that presumption. So next we move on to did the, um, uh, did the parents receive reasonably equivalent value? And in the Palladino case, I, I did something a little bit unique in that um, I produced evidence, I produced affidavits from the parents um, that said that they felt an obligation to, pay, to make the payments, that uh, they felt they were going to have a, by doing so they would have a financially self-sufficient daughter who would be less likely to have to live at home, that if she didn't get her degree, she would, she would be um, likely to have to be supported by her parents. I had two um, experts file reports, one expert on financial aid, and under all of the financial aid laws, um, there is an expectation that the parents were, will, or the family will be the first source of, of um, financing for um, a child's education that's built into the, um, to the laws of the United States with respect to financial aid. And uh, you, you cannot apply for financial aid without there being consideration of the family income. Um, so, and also I had a social expert social, um, who talked about the benefits of a child receiving an education with all kinds of statistics that, that showed that they made um, considerably more than, um, than uh, if you have a college education as opposed to people with just high school degrees. In fact, on average, adults in a four-year college, uh, with a four-year college degree, earn about 65% more than a um, person who over 40 years works um, uh, and has only a high school diploma. Um, they're more like, uh, someone without a high school diploma is more likely to need and receive financial support from their parents. And on the contrary, um, if you have a child who has a college education, research, research shows they're going to be in a position to provide assistance to an elderly parent uh, if they need it later on in life. So considering all that, Judge Hoffman found that they, there was reasonable equivalent value and with the emphasis, emphasis on reasonably. He found it to be concrete and quantifiable. He, he found it to be an investment and as we all know, people make investments, and sometimes those investments pay off, sometimes they don't. For example, you pay a medical bill, you pay, you pay these bills, you don't know if the result outcome will result in what you hope it will come, come out to be, but if you make an investment, that's not a fraudulent conveyance. Um, and so he, he found there was reasonably equivalent value. Um, he then, uh, the court asked for direct certification to the First Circuit, uh, we argued the, um, we had an argument uh, in October of 2017, 2017, don't make it worse than it is, Long time. <laughs> in October 2017, and we are still awaiting a decision. In all fairness to the First, first Circuit, you know, Puerto Rico is in the First Circuit, and they have been very busy with issues from Puerto Rico. So I don't know if that has something to do with it, but um, you know, they have been, First Circuit has been very busy with those issues. So hopefully we will have an, um, an outcome soon. And obviously, you know what outcome I'm hoping for. Yeah. Well, you know that uh, Judge Glenn, just uh, two and a half months ago, and that Sturman case, took that on and he said increasing likelihood that children would be self-sufficient was not value under the bankruptcy code or New York law. And then you've got 548D2, which defines value for purposes of um, the fraudulent transfer laws. And one of the things that is not included in value is an unperformed promise to furnish support to the debtor or relative of the debtor. Promise to provide economic value to the debtor or relative of the debtor, which could include family members, is pretty close to what we're really talking about. And most of the judges in the recent cases have said, have relied on that section to say that it's not. And I guess that's why Judge Hoffman certified it, wanted it certified, because he knows it's, we all know it's sitting here, that co courts have gone in different directions on this, and we need some answers. Right, and, and to your point, actually, you said that most of the, the cases were, were going in favor of the trustee. Recently, yeah. But by and large, it's a pretty even split from uh, as far as the uh, decided cases. Um, but, it, you know, 
And it's, it's not just the value that Judge Hoffman found was not just um, the possibility that they are going to need the support of their daughter in the future, but it's the fact that they will be relieved of a financial burden because she will not need to be supported by her parents. And the statistics show that there's a much higher likelihood that she is not going to have to live at home, et cetera, et cetera. And, and the value can be indirect. It doesn't need to be direct. The case law is clear on that. Look at the Taryn case where the uh, parents paid for a wedding and the judge found the fact that the parents were able to smell the flowers, eat the food, listen to the music was a benefit. If that's a benefit, how can educating your child not be the same kind of benefit for the, um, for, for the debtors? And going to Judge Glenn's case was a very, I found it to be a very odd case. He, he it's as if he wanted to find for the schools and he was trying to figure out, he found that any payments made on behalf of the child uh, up to the age of 21 was, uh, um, was not avoidable because that constituted reasonably equivalent value. I think we need to, the, so the, the one thing we haven't talked about is the moral and legal obligation and, and how that ties in. And I, and, and I do, because I do think, do think we need to move into um, you know, some of the other examples of payments by parents that might uh, be avoidable or not avoidable. So, so, the, so these cases kind of came about because you know, we're focusing on, on whether these transfers made by parents to a university for their adult children constitute reasonably equivalent value. The value, as, as we all know, is flowing to the child. So the child, the parents pay the tuition, but the value, the real value, conceptually, <laughs> Um, is, is the education that the, that the children get, these children who are between the ages of 18 and 22. So um, a, lot, a lot of the, the, the defenses that have been raised by the universities, um, and I know that it is always, or for the most part, it is the universities being sued. It's never the children. I mean, I think there's one case where the children have been sued. Um, I've sued the children. Okay, so but so we're, we're going to talk so, about yeah, that yeah, soon. So for the most part, we're going we're after the, the deep children. Pockets. That's interesting, and we're not there yet. <laughs> yeah. but we're going to talk about that soon. We're at the deep soon. pockets. We're yeah. skipping. We're skipping yeah. over those children who are still living in their parents' basement, right? So, um, it's so a tough crowd for suing the children. <laughs> yeah. So we're going to wait. Wait till it's near the end, so you can run out of here. Yes, Lynn, keep going. Yeah. So basically, so there are a couple of theories that have come out of this. So um, universities, you know, they're basically kind of making the arguments that they they're pulling together when they talk to the families, talk to the parents. Um, there, you know that. I mean, the, obviously, the Paladinos worked closely with the universities to, to defend the trustees' claim. There, they are basically saying that the parents have one of two obligations. So, if there is a statute on the books in this in the jurisdiction where the case is pending that says that um, children do not reach the age of majority until 21, and there's some sort of either express or implied. Um, concept in the law that parents have to support their children until that age of majority, whether it's 18 or 21, then there is a legal obligation. So a legal obligation is basically satisfying antecedent debt. It's clear, it's clean. And that's it in the kind statute. Of, and that fits right into in reasonably statute, equivalent value. You have a, and, and, the, and I will just back up and say the problem with these cases is the parents are not required to sign a promissory note. The parents don't need to co-sign, right? So when, when these kids enroll, I mean, the easiest, to me, it's just put the parents on the note, put the parents on whatever agreement it is to pay tuition, then, then they are obligated to pay this debt, and when you make a payment, you're satisfying antecedent debt, but that's not how the, the payment structure um, works, even though the parents largely do make these payments. Um, so the other, the other argument, so if you're in a jurisdiction where the age of majority is 18, then, then a lot of the courts will, will say, well, you, you no longer have a legal obligation past the age of 18. So everything you're doing now is not satisfying antecedent debt. There is then this moral obligation that, that is talked about in a lot of the cases, and we can, we can go through, I mean, I have um, some of the quotes here, but there, so kind of just going back to the policy and the, and the way that the um, financial aid forms work and the fact that parents have to put their income on these forms and that um, I believe it's, you know, the they are required to submit these forms until the child is 24. Um, it implies that there is this moral obligation in society that parents, if they can, if they can support their children, if they have the financial means to pay 5,000 or 20,000 or 50,000, um, they should be contributing t towards their child's education. Um, and, and again, you know, 
expecting to receive those benefits, but really just focusing on moral obligation, not really, um, you know, what the, the benefit that flows to the parent. So the, that's kind of where a lot of the cases have drawn the lines, where you, you have a, either a case where the, the age of majority is 21, and it seems easier for the courts to get to um, reasonably equivalent value, where if you have eight, you know, it's the age of 18, then you have to kind of start talking about the more fluffy moral obligations. So. I just want to put a face on this real quick, just for my benefit. Would all the law students in the room right now just raise your hands? Just judges look around. <laughs> <laughs> this is Emory Law School, famous for its bankruptcy uh, curriculum. And uh, I su presume everybody just raised their hand is over the age of 21. But go on. Well, let me, let me actually go back to you, Mike. We've heard Liz has won these cases based on the quality of evidence. You've testified before, not on this, but on other things. Is this just an evidentiary issue? You have to build up a solid evidentiary case. If you build the right evidentiary case, can you win anything? Is that what it comes down to? I think evidence carries you so far. And then I think, come back to what Lynn was talking about, there, there is a, a moral imperative here about how is it that we take care of our children and how is it that we advance our society. And I agree with Neil that this 548 ought to have some sort of exception written in and should all be part of the, the bankruptcy code if we get around to revising it again. But in the absence of that, let's use the court as a means of uh, establishing you know, new precedent. And it sounds like Judges are coming down on both sides of the issue. This had the right right venue, I think, uh, for the Palladino case because there's probably more colleges and universities in the Boston area than anywhere in the world. That's true. And in Connecticut, actually, the, uh, the, uh, there are a lot of Connecticut state colleges, and they've been getting hit hard with these cases, uh, so much so that uh, the Connecticut legislature changed the law in Connecticut and uh, wrote in an exception to... Uh, tuition um, clawbacks, which became effective October 1, 2018. What does it say? That new law? New law it says you can't, you, that, that, you, that any, payments, any payments to, um, uh, for the benefit of any child under the age of 24 uh, for, for secondary education uh, is, it, is exempt from it's exception. Being, that it's an exception. It it's an exception to the to, yeah to the Uniform uh, Fraudulent Tra uh, Transfer Act. And Lynn, you you've you've We've written got a about, question. Oh, right you here. have a question. Yes. 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 I haven't run into anything. That's protected. They've run into all yeah. sorts yeah, of stuff. Yeah, so that's, that's, the that's a legal obligation. Like, right. no, though I have been, I had a case where the trustee did sue, despite the fact there was a a uh, separation agreement approved by the court, but uh, the, you know, there are many, I think it's 25 states have um, uh, laws that uh, allow uh, family court judges to uh, order uh, or approve settlements that uh, require parents to pay for the undergraduate education of their, of their children. And um, that, that's a legal obligation. That, that's, in my opinion, E. 48D2. It yeah. says yeah, uh, value is defined as the satisfaction or securing of a present or antecedent debt of the debtor. So that becomes a legal obligation that, um, that is being satisfied. So the transfers to satisfy a legal obligation are, by definition, a 548 value. And so you don't have. Yeah. Well, well if you're going to put that onus on this colleges, then, then they're, you're going to have to have them say, okay, let's get the financial records four years back or five years, six years, depending upon the stat, which is just obviously something colleges are not equipped to do. Um, so, I mean, if you're, and talking about legal obligations, I mean, you know, it's very clear that in con Congress's judgment uh, that parents should be the first source of funding. When I, 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 you know, look to the financial aid laws where, Family income must be considered. If you have a, chi a child um, in school, you get to uh, declare a tax exemption um, up to the age of tw 24. Uh, if they're not in school, 
it ends at 18. You've got the 529 plans. You have all kinds of incentives um, in, in the laws of the United States that, say, that make it very clear that they, you expect the family to be the first source of funding. Uh, so if, if, if Judge Glenn, in his case, can say that because the age of, of majority in New York is age 21, despite the fact there is no legal obligation in New York for, the, um, for a parent to educate their child beyond, beyond the age of 17 and a half, uh, it, that seems to me a little, a little fuzzy right there. If that's an obligation, if you can look to that as an obligation to, um, to, pay, to support your child and reasonably equivalent value, why aren't all these other laws which uh, infer that parents must pay for support their children um, through the, for college education? You know, in Palladino, your case, if they had contributed to a 529 plan years earlier and that's where the payments came from, we wouldn't have a case at all because nobody would challenge it. And, uh, exactly. It wouldn't even be property of the estate. Yeah, and that was that, exactly that, my that's point. That's an interesting point. That, this, is, this is policy and this is, this is where I, I get, this is why I started writing about this. So, so basically, if, if a parent contributes to a 529 plan uh, over the course of, you know, as the, as the child is, is, is aging, growing up, getting... Or grandparent. Do what? Grandparent can or grandparents, yes, yes. But we, yeah. you know, for here, we see these cases are largely parents. So they're putting in money every year. They're saving. They're putting it in a 529 plan to obtain the tax benefits. Um, and if they file bankruptcy, they, they so, so a lot of these times it's it's kind of like a these parents to be able to afford tuition have you know they're they're employed and there's like a, a litigation or some sort of um, one time event that interferes with their ability to. Um, to pay their debts, so it's not like they're you know excessive use of credit cards. Usually, it's um, it's like an event that that they did could not anticipate. So they were not putting. This, there's no intentional fraud here. These aren't people that are throwing money into their 529 plans so that they don't have to pay their creditors. They're putting them, they're putting money away so they they, they can pay for their kids' education. So um, if if that parent happens to file bankruptcy, let's say two years after they stopped funding, and then um, well, let's, let's, talk about this, let's back up and then. So, so they make, they use the 529 plan to pay tuition. They, they file bankruptcy and the trustee makes a demand, let's say, you know, goes through the, the bank statements and sees that, you know, these payments were, were funded from the, the checking account to um, the university, issues a demand. If those funds were placed, if so let's say that if the parent took the money out of the 529, put it in his or her bank account and then paid the university, and those funds had been in the 529 plan for at least two years, then, then that money is off limits. So that 541 is, is the definition of property of the estate, as I'm sure you know. Um, and it accepts funds that had, had been placed in a 529 plan from property of the estate. So there's this like weird dynamic with you, it's okay to use your 529 plans, but you can't use your checking account. So, but that's a Congress, that's Congress acted. That's sometimes what the says. A, sometimes there's a tracing problem where you claim it's from a 529 plan, but it doesn't match up with the contributions to it. So, I mean, that yes. brings up some other issues, but basically what you're saying is you right. You have to use those funds. I mean, there is one case where the, where the right. judge just said, you, I, there's, you put the, that money in your account, but you had already paid one, one of your tuition bills, and then, and then it looks like you were paying your groceries with that money too, and then you wrote a check like two months later, and the, and the, the debtor or the university just couldn't prove that, that I yeah, 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 so you have to actually do it yeah, right. By and large, the money and yeah, the university in that, that case yeah. won, won and lost. They, yes. they traced the money. It ended up settling for five grand, I think, that case. Did they? But is that the Skidmore decision case? on it? Yeah, I went on the docket. I was yep. just curious. There was a question over there. What, what, tell, us what your, tell us what your name is. I'm sorry, Brian? Yeah, Brian. Yeah. Brian, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, one was a practicing, practicing doctor, right? There was a practicing OB um, who, with changes in, in reimbursement for her insurance, um, causes decline in revenue for her medical practice. I mean, it looked like her net income was about a million a year for many years. Yeah, and, um, and then it dropped to like 100. Yeah, and I, I had a situation, well, like I said, in the Palladino case, they were, uh, the father ended up going to jail and the mother was um, uh, on probation, but um, they were, you know, convicted of being of participating in a Ponzi scheme. Although, in talking to the debtors, they um, 
they, they, there's two sides to every sto story. Um, and an, in, another, in another case, another case um, uh, the, the mother, uh, the, and that's the case where we had the uh, divorce decree, uh, she lost her job. So yeah. there are a whole host of scenarios. In another case, the, uh, one of the parents got very sick and they ran up medical bills. I've got one uh, right now where the um, debtor had um, a limited amount of money, and I don't know why she did it this way, but she was not advised. She did not see a lawyer. She was not counseled properly. But she basically didn't pay her mortgage on a very nice home for three years and instead used the money to finance the uh, education uh, at Harvard of um, two of her, uh, her two, my, two youngest kids. And um, when she came into the bankruptcy case, uh, this was just a disaster all around. Um, she filed the Chapter 7 three years after getting a discharge in her earlier Chapter 7, so she wasn't even going to get a discharge. You know, so the, the only purpose in filing, I think, was to get an automatic stay to stop this foreclosure. But she filed the case 30 minutes after the foreclosure sale. <laughs> And, um, and then she went on a trip somewhere, and um, while she was gone, it was a third, it was not a credit bid by the lender, which is what you normally see. This was a third party investor that had come in and bought it. By the time she got back, she had been evicted and all of her stuff was out on the street. This is the story anyhow, and all the books and records were gone. That's the story anyhow. I keep saying that because I, I wasn't able to independently verify that. But I mean, we do know that the home was foreclosed. We do know that she didn't pay the mortgage for several years. And she said it was because she used all the money to pay for the kids' education. Why she didn't um, uh, do this in a different way or have them take out, you're talking about presumptions and greater likelihood, greater likelihood. Well, when you go into Harvard, there's a greater likelihood that you're going to get a good job afterwards and you're going to be able to um, pay your student loans if you had taken them out, which they didn't. You know, so there are stories when these things happen, like Ponzi scheme. I mean, you've got, you've got these back stories that sometimes don't come out at all. But you talk about a tragic event, and, and she doesn't even get a discharge in the Chapter 7, so it's completely pointless, the whole, the whole case for her. She you, gets no benefit from it at all. Neil, did you sue Harvard? Are you suing Harvard? No, um, no. Uh, the judge went to Harvard, so I decided not. To. <laughs> uh, but the um, a actuality, in actuality, He's not joking. <laughs> in actuality, this is the case where I um, sued the. Um, we haven't talked about him yet, but we will. I think the direct parent plus loans, which is another vehicle. Um, there were a lot of. We couldn't get the records from her, from this debtor, but we got the records from. Um, from the banks that we had subpoenaed and from Harvard, and we saw that, these, that a lot of this was direct parent plus loans, which the cases say you can't go against the institution because this is not property of the debtor. It's no money ever passes through the, de to the debtor parent's hands at all. It goes right from the lender. And th this comes out, if, you, if you're not familiar, with the Higher Education Act of 1965. I only became familiar with it because these cases. It was a funding vehicle for the education of these children. And um, these Parent PLUS loans go from the lender to the school. They don't go through a bank account of the parent. The parent never touches the money. Um, but what, so I could not sue the university under these cases for the monies that they received under that act, under these direct Parent PLUS loans. And so we looked at it and I said, well, one thing I can do is I can um, sue to avoid the incurrence of the debt. Most people think of 548 as only avoiding fraudulent transfers, fraudulent transfers. But when you read it, it also talks about avoiding the fraudulent incurrence of the debt. And you have the same reasonably equivalent value issue, of course, and you don't get around that, you're still gonna have to fight that out. But um, to me, the, the, the parent received no economic value that's the argument we're having. But the parent received no economic value, and so that the debt was fraudulently incurred. And to me, this, the student is the party for whose benefit the debt was incurred. And so we went after the student who is, that's the case I told you I'd done that, because the student has a really big job with Microsoft and is making a lot of money. And um, I said, you know, I'm going to avoid getting into all of the weeds with Harvard or any, you know, we're just going to go right after the student. And so that's like the one example. But, but people do did overlook. Did you bring that suit? What? Did you bring that suit? Or was it a demand? Did you actually, did that? It's pending. It's pending. Oh, we can't talk about that. It's pending. Um, okay. So if you think about it, so basically, 
So you, you cannot just take funds out of your checking account and, and pay a university, but a parent can, well, depending on the type of loan, if a parent takes out a parent plus loan and those funds are used to pay the tuition, then, then, then no one can be sued. Basically, um, the courts are holding that those funds never become property of the estate because they, under the Higher Education Act or whatever the statute is, they could never be property of the parent because they have to go to the university. They could never be used to pay creditors. So, so those cases are pretty clear. Those are, there's, a, I think, two or three of those now. Um, but and on top of that, there, yeah. on top of that, the loan yeah. is a non-dischargeable yeah. debt. The, the parents would have to repay, uh, yes. regardless so of the bankruptcy. There's some hands up. We have Sorry. questions. Let's, let's here, go ahead. Here. I'm so engrossed with the panel. Another question from you, gentlemen, sir. I, I, yeah, I've, I've raised that as a defense and, and actually warded off an action being filed because in my response to the demand letter, I made a good argument that they weren't insolvent based on the information I could locate, and the trustee decided not to fight that battle with me because um, uh, I, th I think at least for the majority of the payments, I think the trustee would have had a hard time showing they weren't Solvent, weren't solvent at the time they made the payment. Trustee has a, a, to investigate that as best the trustee can. Um, I just brought one where I took the debtor's um, 2004 exam before I filed the lawsuit, and uh, and he admitted that. Um, I mean, he wasn't fighting the issue, but he he, had, he acknowledged that uh, his uh, liabilities greatly exceeded his assets at the time of the transfers. Um, but I took that examination before I brought the lawsuit. In the Southern District of Georgia, in the Dunstan case, which was Judge Coleman's case, um, it went the other direction because uh, when, he, when he looked at the evidence, it looked like, the, and, the, and the debtor had, uh, the debtor was a very sophisticated, formerly well-off debtor and um, had personal financial statements, uh, had loan applications out there. So you, you sort of had a trajectory towards the bankruptcy that showed that, that she was very solvent. Um, and so the trustee lost a lot of the claims on solvency alone. Uh, the 529 was also part of this, but there were some tracing issues, so it couldn't be granted on summary judgment. And then the judge on reasonably equivalent value said that, no, it's not reasonably equivalent value. So there's something in that decision for everyone, depending on you know how you look at this. But the solvency point was that he found that the debtor was solvent for most of the transfers. Uh, not rendered insolvent. The ones that got avoided in that case were we're not subject to summary judgment, I should say. I think it settled before they got to the end. Um, were the ones that were close in time to the bankruptcy where you could look at the schedules 50-something days after the last transfers and see that things had turned and she became massively insolvent you know, by the time of the bankruptcy. But it is a big issue, and it's all the defenses that exist under 548 normally exist here. There are just some other ones as well because the 529 plans, the parent direct plus loans, we're going to talk about commercial conduits in a minute, but um, there are just some other defenses that you don't typically um, see that apply in this area. So let's stop there and let's just kind of... We had one more question. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry, go ahead, and I was going to do a quick recap. Go ahead. What's your name? Yes, James. Well, what I've been reading is that education is going to be free for everybody, so none of this is going to yeah, matter yeah, in a yeah. few years. I mean, un, you know, under the federal uh, Let's not financial go there. <laughs> yeah, under the federal financial aid um, uh, laws, you know, you you have you know, it, it all depends upon um, the family finances, the students' finances, as to what type of loans they're going to be able to get. So, depending upon their financial status, uh, will uh, it will dictate what type of uh, federally insured loans, and and yes, uh, I, I guess to your to answer your question, if you if the education is being financed by uh, a, a government uh, guaranteed loan, that is non dischargeable, and um, there I guess is a, a better chance that the the university is going to be able to to collect on that debt. You have to be mindful of concentration risk in any business where your sources of revenue coming from and you can point at the for-profit higher education business 
and uh, get a good sense of what happened there when they started cutting off uh, loans for kids that weren't really getting the education and then those businesses went out. And I'll also add, um, we're talking about, back to Bob's question about solvency, that um, I, Judge Deal and Judge Ellis Monroe both have opinions from our district on pleading, how you, what is required to plead constructive versus actual fraud. One is the Rule 9, greater requirements, more specificity than the uh, constructive fraud, lesser pleading standards. So if you're going to be pleading one of these, you, you, those are good opinions to look at to know what, um, what thresholds you need to clear to survive a motion to dismiss, for instance. And I just want to just, we will talk a little bit about things that I think colleges and universities need to do. They're very slow moving to react, but you know, we're gonna, I think we're going to segue into a couple of things, or one, one concept that appears to be working. The, the portals? Yes. We're going to talk about the portals, but yeah. we'll take a break right now, just real quick, just to kind of unpack this, because we've <laughs> covered a lot, and I want to make sure everyone's, everyone's keeping up, because I'm even having a hard time. We got a 548 action, a constructively fraudulent transfer action. A transfer was made by a debtor, a parent, that was insolvent, if they were insolvent, that's a factual issue, to uh, a party that provided no value, the college, to the parent, but maybe it provided reasonably equivalent value through indirect benefit that, that, is, that is concrete and that is quantifiable. That is, those are legal, uh, those are factual issues that you have to get into the evidence. So you got an evidentiary issue on solvency, you got an evidentiary issue on reasonably equivalent value, you have all of the policy arguments which permutate all of this. You have all these weird concepts that create exceptions that no one thought about. If you're making the payment pursuant to a divorce decree, well then you're satisfying a debt. The divorce decree puts a debt on the debtor to pay for the kid's education, so then you're satisfying a debt, and 548 says satisfying a debt is not a fraudulent transfer. So you have the divorce decree exception. You have 529, where if the money was set aside long enough in advance, then it's not property of the estate. If it's not property of the estate, it's not a fraudulent transfer under 548, because 548 talks about a transfer of property in which the debtor has an interest. So you have all these provisions of the code that, that come into play, and then you have all these exceptions created by other parts of the code or other parts of federal law. And it's really, really fascinating. This is what's so interesting about bankruptcy is so many different things are coming into play. So everyone's now caught up. Everyone's now um, achieved mastery on all of these topics. Lynn's going to tell us about another exception to the fraudulent transfer theory. Lynn? Yeah, sure. So obviously the easiest way to defend any litigation is to actually rely on the bankruptcy code. Um, and once a transfer is avoidable under the face of 548, the trustee still has to get through 550. And 550 um, provides a defense for the, not the initial transfer, which, which would be the college or university. Well, we'll talk about that. <laughs> Deemed to be the initial transfer. Um, but the, the trustee may not avoid the transfer from um, a immediate or immediate transferee that takes for value in good faith. So what has happened very recently, we have two cases from 2019, I believe. Um, we're seeing that when a parent makes a payment for a child's tuition, um, it is received by a university, and a couple of these universities, one is Hofstra, they have set up these electronic portals for each student. So they're basically like mini bank accounts. So um, when the money comes in, it is put in that bank account, and it is not released uh, until, t until the student actually starts taking classes, enrolls, and tuition is due. So a lot of times these um, payments are coming in before the, you know, the start of the semester. Um, they hit, I think they're probably, I'm sure they're required to be paid in advance, right? In advance, in advance of the, it, yeah, they're, yeah, so they're put in this portal. Um, so when, um, what, what happened in, in one of these cases, or Pergament v. Brooklyn Law, is there were a series of payments made over time um, and what the court or the university stated was that we were not the initial transferee, we were the immediate um, transferee. We received, the initial transferee of these funds was the student. Um, we, we put them in that portal. We could not access them. We had no right to spend that money until that student enrolled. 
So if you think about it, generally, I, I, to me, the student is always the initial transferee, right? I mean, it's like you're making a gift to your child. You just happen to give it to someone else. But So that's, that hasn't really developed in the case law yet. This makes it cleaner. I mean, clearly, if you set up a bank account and, and, um, and, the, and the university acknowledges that it cannot spend that money. So what, what the courts are doing is they're looking, they just, let's say eight transfers are made. You just you know pause time and you go back in time and you look okay at that time that that payment was made was that an advance payment and if so if this if the student had not yet enrolled the funds were not yet um, able to be spent by the university then you know they are still you know assets of the um, of the student and the you know the, the universities are able to say well we. Um, we were not the initial transferee, and therefore we can bring in 550B. And since we gave value, and the code actually doesn't say doesn't say you have to give value to the party that paid the money. It's just if you give value, it's a little bit um, it's a little bit less clear, you know, in, in where that value has to go. And you, you take that money in good faith. Well, of course they did. They had no idea the parents were insolvent. Um, and then there's a complete defense. So we have two of those, two of those cases. Two universities are using this portal system that I know of. Um, but that, I mean, that's a nice creative, to me, um, creative defense that might actually work. So why can't, can't colleges just kind of fix things? You know, we don't want your checks. We don't want your cash. We've set up these portals. They're very simple. Put the money in the portal. I mean, isn't that, I mean that, is that the solution to this, to all this lawyer gobbledygook? I, I think I, you might be surprised as to how many uh, universities are possibly already using that method. I think this, I mean, the Pergament case, uh, which was decided by Judge Craig in 2018, um, was the first of those cases. And I think it was in highly creative that they came up with that, um, I mean, that they looked at that and were able to uh, assert that defense. Um, I'm having um, the colleges that I uh, represent, in particular Sac Sacred Heart University, because I've had several cases for them, um, and I'm having them look at, look at the way they do things and see if they don't, in fact, do it that way because a lot of the stuff I'm going back and looking at, it seems like they may actually be doing something similar. And if not, then you're right. The universities should fix it so they are doing it that way. But if they are doing it that way, then you have on the um, appeal um, the refundable, non-refundable aspect to it. Right, or, right, because if the... the, the um, well, at least a recent decision out of Connecticut, um, a very recent decision um, by Judge Tancredi, he found for the um, University of Connecticut that anything that was um, paid and at the time it was paid was refundable, um, then that was uh, not recoverable as a fraudulent transfer. But the minute it became non-refundable, it was paid and it was non-refundable, then that portion there was no reasonably equivalent value. No longer value. A commercial conduit. No longer a commercial conduit. Yep. I'm yeah. sorry, I forgot that was a really, that's a key point. So, the, so basically the, these cases turn on the fact that the, that the money that was put in that portal is actually, actually refundable to the student, not to the parents. So, so once it hits that portal, only the student can access those funds, um, which kind of you know, solidifies that you know, the students you know, are, are the initial term. I think I should just say that like last month, I was presenting this in Colorado, and again, I was fortunate not to have opposition with me, but um, I actually changed it from, it was part of, a, I originally had it as part of a consumer case all update, but I was also doing a business case all update, and I moved it to the business case all update. And the reason I did that is because so often when I send demand letters or file suit, I get these giant law firms from around the country who are defending the universities or the top lawyers, you know, in their area. Uh, and I, and you're, you're dealing with cases like bonded financial, which you only usually see in a Chapter 11 setting. You don't even hear about that in consumer cases. I said, you know what, I'm going to move this to the business case I'll update. And the business lawyers in there were fascinated by it. And, um, and I think they probably have, and from the bigger firms, have people in their law firms that represent universities, and we're going to be looking into it to see if they get some business out of it, and slow times as it is, I guess, for bankruptcy lawyers. But, um, but I, I actually, I know this is a consumer session, but I really think that this is, um, is, appeals to the business uh, law community, too. Well, it's, it's I hope that satisfies you know, your question, Mark. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure if it does, but this is... A, I mean, that's what's so interesting about it is we're all so passionate about it. We, all, we, we love it so much. But this is a, a financial issue as much as it is a consumer issue. And that's one of the things that's so, uh, that's so interesting about this. You know, 548 concepts carry. 
They carry everywhere. Yes, so. yes they do. Uh, and they're designed to. Yeah. And they're absolutely designed to. So I would note as well that the Connecticut decision that uh, uh, they're talking about, it's in the materials called Mangan versus University of Connecticut Inri Hamadi, uh, favorably cited the Emory Bankruptcy Development Journal, a student comment written two years ago. So yeah. what you're doing matters. It matters. It's read. People think about it. Uh, it's a very, very powerful piece. Mark, there's a statistic that I'm, I was going back through some of my older stuff that I don't use anymore. There was an article in the Wall Street Journal, May 5 of 2015, almost four years ago. At that time, they were able to identify 25 cases. Now it's like 25 a month. Yeah. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> they had 25 total cases at that point, in a May 5, 2015 article where universities have been sued on these clawback, tuition clawbacks. And, and, and there are uh, numerous others that have been um, settled without a lawsuit being, being brought. I know, I, I know of a, uh, a lot of them in uh, Connecticut, uh, Connecticut um, College, I know, gets, uh, gets demands. What, what is going on in Connecticut, by, by the way? There are, there's, so, there's, there's half the reported decisions come out of Connecticut, it seems like. Well, you know, uh, Connecticut is a pretty broken state right now, financially, and the, the economy um, is in very bad shape, so I have a lot. Uh, it may have to do with the the fact that um, we have a lot of debtors who are having to file bankruptcy, and they pay for college uh, tuition for in in university. I I, I don't know. All altogether, there every system in Connecticut, unfortunately, is is very very. Broken. Maybe your trustees in Connecticut got into this earlier than in other places too. Um, we have one particular attorney. He's not a trustee, but he. He latched on to this issue very, very early on, and he goes to the trustees and says, I'll rep represent you on a contingency fee basis. He was actually written up in the Wall Street Journal. So, um, Would you give him my name, please? Yeah, I, <laughs> but he, he uh, actually, after I won um, at the bankruptcy court in Palladino, he went to Mark Di Giacomo and said, I'll handle the appeal for you pro bono. Really? Come yeah. on. Is he doing a good job? I think he did a very good argument at the First Circuit. So, I mean, in all fairness. To well, the one opponents. thing about the First Circuit sitting back while they handle, I guess, these Puerto Rico issues is there's a lot of decisions at the bankruptcy court level coming out uh, since this case was originally certified, a lot of decisions, yes. and a lot of them from your state. That, yeah, that is accurate. So could this ever happen? This is what I was thinking about last night, as just for, like, policy or things to talk about. What about Chapter 11? So, so could a parent, you know, know that insolvency is coming, know that it needs a Chapter 11 restructuring, right, and decide to make payments to the, to the college, file a Chapter 11 plan, file a Chapter 11 case, and then bring suit against the universities and then recover those funds to pay its creditors? Could that work? Keep I, mean, I don't know. I mean, I, I, that's an interesting question. Um, it's almost you know, most, most cases that I have been involved in, um, the, the parents have been supportive. Uh, you know, it... A, a university does have the ability, I think in that situation, the university definitely would turn around and sue, uh, bring the student in as a third party. In my cases, the, um, the universities have determined not to do that for, for uh, their own policy reasons yes. um, and publicity reasons. Uh, but, PR. Um, but, uh, PR, yes. absolutely. Um, but in that case, I think that definitely, the the, would I would certainly call. advise my client to bring that uh, student. So, and the student, if they're still a student, they could refuse uh, to allow the student um, to participate in classes. They could withhold their degree. I, I wasn't involved in the case, but I know of one situation where um, a trustee sued and the college refused to allow the uh, kid to graduate so, and get their degree. So, um, and, you know, withhold transcripts, withhold, you know, they'd have a lot of an ability to cause injury to the student if a uh, debtor decided to be hostile. I mean, you can pay uh, all four years in advance. You know, you can sure. pay prepay tuition. It's not always that you're not paying you have four years. Years. No, semester, or three. a semester. <laughs> so these can come up in, in different ways. But if you if you prepay somebody for four years and did it that way, I, I, I don't think the reaction would be very uh, welcoming from the sure. university. I think that they would react pretty harshly to that. And of course, um, the debtor might not might wait until the student has graduated before. That would be better timing. Yeah. That would be, yeah. I definitely. Kiss your alumni donations goodbye. Well, yeah, I yeah, know. I, and I also know um, where uh, uh, 
some colleges have made settlements with the trustee and they turn around and um, make demand on the parents or the student and they, they've gotten repaid by the parent after being, uh, settling the lawsuit okay. for a minimal amount. Okay. We have a question over there. What's your name? Yes, Riley. So when stressing is really a different value, is there any that you're talking about spending over time, it's still it's still exactly the same as the They're stagnant, yeah. Yeah, so at university they're continuing to increase the cost because these are all the trustees and they're not really doing well. No. <laughs> no, it just means, what it means is the reason why these, I think this, this trend has started is because college is so expensive now, those payments are so high that the trustees, they have to focus, they have a fiduciary duty re to recover assets, right? If you see a $25,000 check, it, but you, yeah, it used to be, you know, it used to be lower amounts, so I don't think they were, um, they were on the radar, but they certainly are large now. But these, these lawsuits and these recoveries that the trustee are, are making or attempting to make, I mean, this goes to the bottom line of college, uh, of, you know, the college's bottom line, and they have to make up those losses some way, yep. in some way, so this is contributing to the um, increase in cost of education. Also, the, um, is Riley, is that your name? So, Riley, um, one of the um, benefits, if you want to call it that, or, or, or the opposite of being a, a trustee is we see everybody's bankruptcy schedules when they file. And um, the amount of student loans that we see is staggering, just staggering. Um, and I, I'm assigned generally once a week 25 cases, and some of them are a couple and some of them are individuals. But a husband and wife can file, that's one case. But we look at the schedules, and I used to see a small amount of student loans, and I would say at least two-thirds of the cases that I see now, and this is strictly Atlanta division, I'm not speaking for the country, but. But in my division, I'd say two-thirds of the cases have student loans, which are almost always going to be non-dischargeable. And the bankruptcy, a lot of times, has to do with you got to get rid of everything else to be able to start paying back the student loans. There's not enough money to go around. The, the, the sad cases are where uh, somebody has spent two or $300,000 and, and is still trying to get an associate's degree. Sure. I mean, I, I, I don't understand that. but. But I'm, uh, I, that, that is like the response I get under oath. And because I, I ask, well, what, when I see huge amounts of student loans, what are the debts? I mean, what, what are your degrees and so on and so forth? If you are, and a lot of them are online schools, which uh, may not be from private universities, but which may not be marketable. If you remember, the Obama administration started targeting some of those schools. And there was a lot of pushback for a lot of reasons. I, I, I look at the number of people that I see that have degrees from those schools that appear to be worthless, just totally worthless. But by the same token, that uh, the money is so available for the student loans that do you really have to have your parents pay if you're going to Harvard and you're going to have a great job afterwards? And I don't. And, and the mother's not making mortgage payments. I mean, I mean, you got to look at this from all sides. But it is staggering the amount of student loan debt that is out there. And when you look at the level of education that some of the people actually got for that amount of debt, there is no way they can ever repay that debt. But on the, by the same token, of course, they signed off, and, and I don't think anybody's been advising these uh, borrowers, student loan borrowers, uh, of what they're getting into. Well, that's, the whole, that's a whole other issue. It's a whole yeah, other yeah, issue. We don't want to get into it. But it is staggering. But it is. Yeah. I only say yeah. it because it's an alternative, and they nationalized the student loan program about 10 years ago, and I'm not gonna get into the politics of that or why they did that, but they did it. And the money is just like, it's like an open spigot. Uh, I mean, almost anybody can get it. And, um, and so uh, it's just a fact that you deal with when, that's just one of my counters to when Liz talks about it. I said, well, there were other options where, where the student would be responsible. Maybe the parent wouldn't guarantee it, maybe not. Sure. So this, so this whole issue, though, this is, you know, if you think about it, if you step back, this issue of, kind of go back to the basics of these cases, is what is a reasonable expense for a parent to pay? What is support? What, like, what, what, what is okay and what is not okay when um, you're looking at payments that are debtor made to, it, to you know, his or her family? Um, is it okay to pay for a vacation? Is it okay to pay for your kid's car? Can you pay for their insurance? 
Um, can you go out to dinner? Can you have a holiday party? I mean, there, there's, this concept is, is, um, is murky, and especially as, as expenses rise. And it comes into play in some other places too. So when you, know, you file a chapter 13 case, you have to devote your disposable income to the plan. So what if the parent is you know, paying private school tuition? What if the parent is, has been helping with college tuition? Um, can the parent continue to do that? And I do not focus on chapter 13 and I will not um, pretend to, to say that I have uh, true knowledge of, of that issue, but I, I know it's out there. Um, and, and it's kind of an analogy, and it also flows into even Chapter 11, where you also, have, again, have to d devote your disposable income to pay creditors under a plan. It's an issue, you know, it's, it's a policy. It's, it's, it is this kind of societal expectation that, parents, like, kids, I hate to say it, they're not really adults at 18. I mean, they're still being supported. They, they certainly, um, they're not independent, let's say that. They are adults, of course. At, you're, you're not truly independent, not tr truly financially independent anymore at 18. Um, not really until you graduate, um, unless you unless you have a trade or or you in the military or you're doing something um, other than head off to college. So you know, I think parents parents that are filing bankruptcy with kids that are between 18 and 21 have to face these issues. Liz, yes. I think one of your experts in here said that the age of financial independence was about 24. Right, 24. And then also, we're allowed to, I, I've got twin boys that are gonna be 24 soon, I can keep them on my health care until they're 26. Yeah. So there's this arbitrary line in the sand about when do kids become uh, financially independent. And everybody, all the law students in here are of m major age, but I'm sure still largely financially dependent upon their parents. So. Well, there's, there's two different issues here. You're talking about financial independence, and I'm talking about legal independence. Uh, you know, the reality is what you're talking about. And, uh, well, I kind of live in reality, Mike generally. Mike deals in reality. <laughs> well, this, Mike, this is a law school. Yeah. The reality My wife's opinions there. to the contrary, but yeah. yeah. But that is the reality. That, yeah. is, that yeah. is what's exactly. going on. That. You know, and speaking of you know, uh, private uh, school education, there was a very aggressive trustee in, um, in New York, in the Eastern District, who sued debtors who paid for private school for their um, minor children under age 18, saying that that was a fraudulent conveyance. Um, and of course, the judge shut them down and said no, <laughs> that, that, that they received reasonably equivalent value. They're minors. They're, they're, uh, Parents have an obligation to pay for the education of a minor child. child. Exactly. And they, yeah. But the trustee's argument was they that they could have went to public school and received the same education, et cetera, et cetera. And so I guess my point is it, it's okay for parents to um, pay for private school for a minor. That's, not, that's reasonably equivalent value. Then how can it not be reasonably equivalent value for a parent to continue to educate their child based on the fact of, of not only societal expectations, but the way the laws have been written with respect to um, uh, the provision of education uh, and, and the tax laws and the 529 plans. Well, that trustee didn't, doesn't attend my seminars, or he wouldn't be bringing it against minor children. But um, the way you, you, the way, if you really, if the trustee really felt that way, that there was some sort of abuse, the remedy is not what he did. The remedy is reported to the U.S. trustee under a 707 referral if, if he thinks that that this is under the totality of circumstances, some sort of abuse, which I've seen done. It happened in one of my cases. I did not make the referral, but the U.S. trustee did bring an action successfully under 707 for the um, debtors uh, educating at very expensive private schools and, and at very expensive... The, the, the back story is too complicated, but the point is that they actually dismissed the case under 707. And that, that was the remedy that they followed there uh, for a for paying the tuition of a minor child. I actually testified against dismissal for a lot of reasons, but um, I'm concluding that the debtor was 67 years old and they had small children, and I didn't think that he'd be able to um, ever renew a contract when he hit the maturity of that contract. He was under at age 69. I didn't think that they would re-up, and um, that's what happened to him. Yeah, I'm, I'm quite sure the uh, trustee's intent there in bringing the action was not to uh, alleged abuse, but in order to make a recovery and get a get a commission. <laughs> well, well, and get money to creditors. Right. And get and money get to it, creditors. Well, I, I mean, that, actually, that's what trustees do money too. To creditors. Actually, in that case, I'd already liquidated all the assets. It was already done, and so that wasn't that was already going to happen, whether it was dismissed or not. That you know the, the, that I'd have to be paid. So it wasn't about that. 
It was about what I thought was a, a, a wrong outcome uh, and that the, um, somebody of that age, I thought, um, wouldn't be, ever be able to make up the money um, in the workplace. You didn't have that many working years left, and I, so I thought needed the discharge and, and should have gotten it. But that's another story. Yeah, so um, the question is, is where we're going with this, right? Because we're at the, at the point where these cases have been evolving since, I think, around 2011, and do we think Congress will react? So this did, you know, there was a time when trustees used to sue churches and charities, right? Um, if, if a debtor had been tithing or donating, uh, making donations to um, you know, local re cancer research organization, those, those were gifts. Those, you don't receive technically any economic value from that. So they fall within the face of 548 and Congress reacted, amended the bankruptcy code and accepted um, certain um, donations to charity. They, you know, the, the limit depends on whether, you know, you had been donating on a regular basis in the past and, it, and it's, it's tied to a percentage of income. Do we think we will get there? I mean, we have 541 was amended, that's a favorable um, change to protect 529 plans. Do we think we will get there? Well, I think, I mean, I'm not confident that Congress is going to do much of anything in the next few years. Sure. Um, but I think what we need is we need the, uh, we need a, a split in the circuits so we can get it to the Supreme Court and have the Supreme Court make a decision. Sure. I, that's true. And I think that's going to, that unfortunately, I think there's a higher chance of that happening than Congress reacting um, in a... Congress in a, might react if there was an adverse ruling to the universities at the Supreme Court level um, and, and there was a big enough push. Right. That, uh, yes. I, but once again, I think that the... We know that there are universities the in every state. Yes. And there are lobbyists for every university that can go and, and, and call on senators and uh, everybody in Congress. Right. And so, so, I mean, if they, if they got together, they could make a pretty powerful lobby, I think, collectively. Right, and I mean, at this point, I don't know of any other um, uh, of these decisions that are actually on appeal at the circuit level. Not that I've heard of. Yeah, not that I've heard of. So there was a district court level, but I. That's yeah, we've had was, some of the that. Judge Craig's it was the district court, but it was remanded. Um, that was the Carla Craig case. Then. Carla, and the issue of the timing of the payments on the portal issue. Well, the neat thing is this gives everyone in this room, especially the students, an opportunity. Now that you've learned about this issue, you've got some materials on this issue, and you've thought about this issue, if you want, if you, want you can start thinking about this issue. You can start writing about this issue. You can start blogging about this issue. There's a lot of outlets out there. And you can do what, what, what these fine professionals have done, which is shoe leather thought leadership. One issue at a time. Let me try to understand it. Let me see what other people are writing about it. Let me write about it as well. Not 40 pages or 60 pages or 80 pages. Just here's something that's going on. Here's a recent decision. And that shoe leather thought leadership will carry you so far in your careers. I want to thank the panelists for this. Uh, this was a great discussion. Is it? Is it really? This was a great discussion. Yeah. Yeah. That was fun.